Hi. Most of us use computers. And if you're like me, you tend to use the same programs, the same applications the whole time. But this is a very fast-moving world with lots of options. And maybe there's a better way. I want to talk today about uh, a journey I took to find a better solution for my, kind of, for my applications, for my use of computers, and maybe discuss about how, for you as well, if you want to take that journey as well, some hints as to how you might begin. This is my factory floor, or as my children say, this is my playground. What you see are vast farms of numbers stretching off in every direction, kind of like a football league table gone wrong. And my job was to take these numbers and to help them to tell their story. So for example, that page at the back there, when you slice those numbers, you get something like this. This is a map of Africa, and it shows by country the rates of tuberculosis across several years. And we see several things. In general, things are getting better. We see the occasional outbreak. And the outbreaks are by country rather than by region, so perhaps political rather than environmental reasons. And when we dig a bit deeper, we find that rates of tuberculosis and the incidence of HIV are very closely connected. A second example. These bubbles represent genes which have been tied to the development of autism. And we take these genes and we see how, how busy they are in different parts of the brain. And we connect genes together by, to develop this network by looking at ones which have similar patterns, to behave in similar ways in different brain tissues. The idea being that genes that behave in similar ways might be connected biologically. They're, they might be in the same pathways. And in such a fashion, we can begin to unpick the complex background behind autism and make some progress in understanding this condition. When you saw those big sheets of numbers, you might think, hmm, they look like spreadsheets. And you might go further and say, well, this is a job for Microsoft Excel. And for a long time, I thought the same thing too. But I found over time, it became more and more difficult to shoehorn my problems into the solutions being suggested by Excel. It became frustrating. So I had to look around and said, well, is there something else I can use instead? And I found this. I found R, which is not so hard to remember, not so easy to Google. It's a program that does a very similar job to Excel. It does a similar job to Excel, but with some big differences. And one of the big differences is that R is open source software. It's free, which is kind of comes hand in hand with open source. And by open source, it means more than just that. It means fundamentally, it means that the code behind this is available to everybody. You can look at it, and what's more, I mean, you, you can use it, and you're expected to work with it. So anybody who comes up with a neat solution to their problems, uh, to their use case with R, can wrap that up in a package and push that out there for everybody else to benefit. And by anybody, it's not just for computer people, it's for accountants and architects and journalists and creative designers and, and scientists like me. In other words, instead of having a set of developers, we have, we've crowdsourced this. Everybody, everybody takes part. You get a very dynamic environment with lots of people contributing. It's, it's from diverse backgrounds, diverse people. It makes it a very exciting place to work. It leads to a sense of community. You're not just a user of the software, you're part of the, the gang that make it. And can I give you some examples of, of how this works? Uh, the sense of community means that people are very quick to share their work, to put that out there. This is work done by David Robinson a couple of years ago. He looked at the tweets being sent out by, 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 by Donald Trump, and there are a lot of them. And he noticed that they came from two different sources. There was an iPhone and there was an Android. And by seeing what the, the words contained within each one, the sentiments contained in each one, there were big differences. The iPhone tweets tended to be more, they had more hashtags, they had more dates and times, they were more, more officious. The Android tweets were much more emotional. And the conclusion was that the, the first set of tweets were produced by the staff, and the Android tweets were sent out by the man himself. David Robinson did a lot of work on this and had like a very thorough analysis, but I'll show you just this one picture he produced. 
we see here these different kind of these different tablets. The ones in red bars, they denote words which are more common in the Donald Trump tweets. And in blue, we have ones which, are, which kind of come from the, from the iPhone. And we'll see there's far more blue, there's far more red. There's far more emotional words within the Donald Trump tweets. But more than just that, the top bar over here, the top four squares, they have far more red. These are negative emotions, fear, disgust, dismay, anger. The ones on the bottom are positive sentiments, surprise, anticipation, trust, joy, happiness. So we get from, like, from, this, from this analysis, we get some insight into the workings of the mind of President Trump. A second example, in a similar vein, Julia Silge looked at the novels of Jane Austen. And each of these boxes represent one of the books. We begin at the left and work our way across to the, to the end of the book. And what you see here is a trace of the sentiments, positive and negative sentiments, within each paragraph of the book as it, as it goes across. And we can see for all six novels, there's, there are similar patterns. We can trace out parts where, the, where these lines dip down deeply, we'll see kind of things where things are going wrong. Uh, we can see, for example, in Tense's Sensibility, there's a very good and deep line when, when Madeline is near death. We can see in Pride and Prejudice, towards the center, there's a dip, which is where Mr. Darcy was proposing for the first time, rather badly. And in Mansfield Park, towards the end, we see the part where Henry's adultery becomes apparent. Uh, so we trace out the pattern of the books by looking at the, the sentence of the words. Our sense of community in R, it also extends into, into help, into online help. When working with other packages, I always kind of went to online help with a heavy heart. You'd get what you're looking for, you'd find the, the solution you want, but it was a series of clicks and a recipe, and it was a bit soulless and a bit unrewarding. You do the same thing with R, and you find a set of responses from people with positive, uh, constructive comments, with humor. Um, if you find a solution that you quite like, you can vote for that. And therefore, people who come looking for the same problem afterwards will kind of be able to narrow down to the ones, the most promising solutions, more rapidly. It's a very exciting place to work. It's not a niche thing. There's lots of open source software out there. I found one word to work for me, but there's far more out there as well. Um, I'm a happy convert to the world of open source. And if you're not happy with your computing environment, if you think it could be better, can I suggest maybe having a look at this too? Thank you very much.